So we'll get on with it. Now next week, as you know, is going to be a big week. It's anniversary day, it's a statutory holiday on the Monday. We've got the film on the Wednesday, the 22nd, the premiere of the journey to New Edinburgh. And on Sunday, we have a church service. I think I said right, that I'm, I'm right in that. But we have the garden party to celebrate our 125th um, of the association. We were formed 125 years ago, 50 years after the founding of the, of the province. So it is an occasion to celebrate. And we're going to celebrate it in style with a garden party. So I hope you've all answered your invitations to be there. Um, so, <laughs> and as if you were interested in this, there is a large number of you here to hear Sean talk about the journey to New Edinburgh. And I think he's talking about the background. So without more ado, we'll get on to Sean. Thank you, Susan. That's for her, is it? That's good. Hey, well, great to have you all here this morning. And it's also wonderful to be able to share little bit of the behind the scenes story of the journey to New Edinburgh. First up I want to acknowledge the fact that the major funder for this project is the Otago Settlers Association and we're great, very grateful for that support because without it we couldn't have done this. So I hope you find that your money was well spent. The journey to New Edinburgh is um, not the first film we've made but in some ways I think it's the most important one. I remember when Will and I were in China in 2017 making our journey to La Nguyen film for the Chinese community, it really struck us then that what we were doing was really important and it was a great template and that we really should apply that template to the foundation group of Otago, the Scots, the English, the Irish, people who came in 1848. And so that was our aspiration thereafter to bring this project off, the journey to New Edinburgh. And as you know, we were going to be doing this back in 2020. We were going to go to Britain then and film the overseas part of it. And we were expecting to release it on Anniversary Day 2021. But something happened in the between time that meant we couldn't go overseas. So we were left a little bit frustrated for two years um, before we were able to go. But in the interim, we made very good use of that time. And I'd have to say that the project is heaps better for the extra time we had to do the research and to um, yeah, just get things organised. So but by the time we finally did get to go, which was last May, we were much better prepared than we would have been if we had gone in 2020. So you know, there's a blessing, we saw the lining in that dark cloud as far as this project goes. <coughs> so international travel, that's something I've always enjoyed. I love the amazing clockwork mechanisms of flights and baggage and all those sort of things. <laughs> How it all works, it's amazing. I mean, sometimes it doesn't work, but most of the time it does, and it's amazing to me. Now, I've always really loved when I got into that little zone outside ordinary life, you left behind all the other people on the ground and you were in the special world of the people who were travelling around the world. You know, it's, it's something I loved. So when it all shut down, I was quite bereft. And, you know, wondered how that would ever get back up and running again. So when we did get to travel, that was one of my first points of interest. How was it all going to work? Um, turn this on. So here we are at the Eden Airport, ready to rock. Um, <laughs> there's our bag. So this is the team, myself on the right, Chris Quack, who's the technician here at the museum and our cameraman, and in charge of all the things technical to do with the project. And on the left, the shadowy background figure of Will McKee, who's actually somewhere in the room here, who's really the power behind the throne for all these film projects. He does all the editing, the directing, he's the boss. Uh, we just work for him, really, and he'd organised everything. And he'd done it, remarkably, in three weeks. Because although we were, you know, keen to go, keen to go, keen to go, 
We couldn't go until we got approval from our bosses all the way up the line to the chief executive of the city council. And for some reason, just took them an inordinate amount of, are you filming this yet? <laughs> <laughs> it took them an inordinate amount of time to make that simple decision, in my opinion. So in the event, we only had three weeks before we left when we got the word to go, because I was teaching at the university in the second half of last year, which meant we had to be back in time for the start of that course. And as the time eat into it, I actually got back two days before I started teaching that course, which was really tight. But it meant that Will had three weeks in which to put all the logistics on the ground in place in Britain, do all the final bookings and all that sort of thing. And he did an amazing job. He's really good at the logistics of it. So this is the beginning of our journey. And this is in Dubai. Now, I'm sure lots of you have been in Dubai. And although it's in the middle of the night, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning, you'll notice that there's not many people about. So, so this was just two weeks after the, or you know, a few weeks after, I don't know how long, but not very long after international travel opened up again and it was still pretty low key. So that's worth uh, looking at. This is when we arrived in Glasgow and this is a really important component of our journey. This big beast, a Mercedes something or other SUV, and we travelled 8,000 kilometres in that and so, you know, it was pretty integral to our, our work. Um, it was good, it was commodious, it handled all the roads, it was a bit wide for some of the little roads. Uh, Will drove 99% of the time, I drove a couple of times, I don't think Chris drove at all, but that's how we got about, and that's in Glasgow, parked up, ready to go. Right, now, if you want to know in detail what we did on a day-to-day -day basis, you may be aware that I, I did a daily blog of our journey, and I know that the Settlers Association site had a link to this, is it still on there? So if you really want to know every day what we got up to, um, Journey to New Edinburgh, the address is at the top there. You'll have, to go, it, it, you'll have to read it in reverse order or go back to the very beginning to find it. When I came home, I printed it out and it was about 270 pages long. So it was a bit over the top to be honest. But it's a way of preserving the memory of what we did because this passed in an absolute blur. Those 8,000 kilometres on the road, we went to 350 something locations. And you can just imagine, you know, I was driving along, this is the methodology. Here's the day's scripts. Have a little board like this. And every day I have so many pages to do. Uh, this particular day is 12, 11 pages. So between locations in the car, I'm reading this and trying to memorise it. Then we get out of the car, do it at the camera, throw that page away. We don't throw it away, we put it neatly in the rubbish, whatever. <laughs> but it's done, we move on to the next page and we go to the next location and I'm reading this. So a lot of the time, instead of looking out the window at the scenery, I'm busy focused on this. So I can't really remember hardly anything about what Scotland looked like out the window. Um, <laughs> so this is really helpful and all the photographs we took as well to try and bring that all back to mind. Now if you want to know where we went, that's the Scottish part of the journey, it's not the whole thing, that's just the Scottish component. And then Will made these maps of the different segments. So that's um, from Midlothian down to the borders, all those little orange spots are places that we had to go and do some filming. Edinburgh will break out in a minute, but that's, we went as far down as you can see over there to um, Newcastle on time. This is in Edinburgh itself, there are a lot of locations in Edinburgh, so that was um, pretty intense those days. We were just walking in, in that case, we walked from place to place. More places out around Edinburgh. Took a few taxis to get some of the outside ones. And then, um, where's this? This is going a bit south, oh no, it's up to Dundee and north. This is when we went as far up as Shetland. And this is the broader pattern when we went over to Ireland. And to get to those places, we drove through 22 counties in three days. <laughs> we were in Dublin for 10 minutes. <laughs> filming. Chris Quack had never been to Ireland before. He's been to Dublin, but he hasn't been to O'Connell Street. He's been to this place on the very outside of town. And we were there for literally 10 minutes. As soon as we'd done it, we were off. That's what, what it was like. Remember we went to John O'Groats, or well, we didn't quite get to John O'Groats, we went right past the turn off to John O'Groats. <laughs> I've lived in Cornwall in my earlier life and 
had a lot to do with Land's End, and I thought it'd be really neat to, you know, Land's End, John O'Groats, but I just had to wave at the sign as we went past. <laughs> There's no mucking around on these journeys. Now that's a page of scripts. They're laminated up, so we're you know, safe from any weather. Uh, if it's raining, we can still stand out there in the rain and hold the script. And I knock those off one location at a time, or there might be more than one at a location. So that first page is just one location there, two bits to do in St Andrew's Square, and so it goes. So when we arrived in Glasgow, the very first thing we did um, was go and visit Sir Tom Devine. Now, I don't know if you know Sir Tom Devine, but he was actually the very first speaker to speak in this auditorium back in 2010. He christened it for us. He's the preeminent historian of Scottish migration. And having his support for our project and the support of other experts I'll talk about in a minute really does add a lot of heft to it. Um, and not only was it, you know, this is great to have him on camera speaking, but it was his works, these magnificent um, historical works by Sir Tom Devine that underpin what we're doing. We're not just, you know, saying any old thing. Um, it's rooted in the historiography. Um, and we spend a lot of time working out the concepts and then tying that down to the nitty gritty, which is our approach, to, you know, get to the detail, but all the time with the overarching historiography, the, the best um, academic work on the subject. So, Sir so Tom, embrace the project. <laughs> Quite literally, that's in his home at Hamilton. And it's now have a little piece of Potnamu with the um, Journey to New Edinburgh logo on it as a me memento of his association with us. He's a, um, is this being filmed? It is, isn't it? He's a very interesting character. <laughs> I have to be careful now that it's being filmed because he might get to see it. Um, anyway, not the only expert. This is also Professor Marjorie Harper. Many of you may know her. She's been to Dunedin before and she's worked on family histories here and she's keen on oral history particularly. That's at the University of Aberdeen. Very generous support from Marjorie, great to have her input as well. Her books on the Scottish diaspora around the world are fantastic works, core texts in the um, course I was teaching in the second half of last year as well. So it was great to be working again with Marjorie, who I've, I've met before. Uh, David Forsyth, I don't know if any of you remember him, he was uh, the curator from the National Museum of Scotland who came here, oh it's over 20 years ago now, to develop the exhibition at the National Museum about the Otago settlement was called Altogether a Delightful Country. So he spent six weeks here at Toitu with us back then and has remained a great friend ever since. He was the one that was responsible for getting me to Scotland, uh, when did I go there, 2012, um, to take part in a um, Scottish military diaspora project that he had on off. So he, he got me to Scotland. It was a great um, opportunity. He's just recently retired from the National Museum and he's now working on his own account taking tours around Edinburgh and Glasgow, I think. But he met up with us um, in his hometown, which is Kirkham Tillich, which is pretty important to the Otago story. You know, the cottage we have here is based on one that was built by immigrants on the Philip Lang from Kirkham Tillich. And he's a great guy because it's, it's his family home. So great to have him there and have his input. And there he is at the top. You know, great to meet him again. Um, and locally, we had, um, I was going to say, Sir Tom Brooking. He's Sir in our, in our minds. You know, Tom Brooking, Emeritus Professor of Otago University, of course, is you know, foremost historian on Otago Scottish um, migration. And he, he, he's a great fan of our, our work and very happy to participate. So there he is in our studio being filmed. And on the right, you've got Philip Temple, who's the biographer of the Wakefields. And the Wakefields come into our story very importantly because this is a Wakefield settlement. And although there's a lot of rubbish that's been spouted about the Wakefield in recent uh, months, in relation to the monument in Wellington, uh, Philip Temple can tell you the you know the real the real go on them. You know, I mean they weren't heroes by any accounts, but they are pivotal figures in our story. Without it, there wouldn't be an Otago. So worth remembering the Wakefields, um, and he, he gives a nuanced account of their role set against the backdrop of First Church. So you'll see that in the film next Wednesday. And here we have Edward Allison because it's really important for us to recognise that when the settlers arrived here. They weren't the first people here, they've been people here for 800 years. And their point of view on the arrival of the settlers is really important to integrate into um, the story. And um, Edward, as the sort of foremost uh, Komato at Utako, did a great job of doing that. And we're really great to have his support as well. And then Professor Angela McCarthy, who's a professor of Scottish studies at the University of Otago, she added her weight to the project too, and was also um, generous with some funding from her 
pool of dough at the university to um, help the project as well, funding some of our photographs and sound files, I think. All right, so that's, that's some of the, um, the backdrop. But you know, the key thing to this project from our point of view, and the reason why it's worth traveling to the other side of the world, is because we want to go to the places where the things happened, the key events happened. And there's no more key event in the evolution and settlement of Otago than this place. That's the Church of St Andrew in central Edinburgh. And that's where the great rupture in the Scottish Church took place in 1843 that's called the Disruption. Now without the Disruption, again, there would be no Otago settlement, or there wouldn't be one that was Scottish and Presbyterian in nature anyway. Because the, the idea of having a settlement in Otago is a little by-blow of that great um, event in, in Scotland in, in 1843, uh, when the Ministers left in high dudgeon uh, to form the Free Church. They broke away from their church at the General Assembly there. And this is a contemporary picture of them walking out the doors there, down the road and down to the Tannerfield Hall, where they then, um, you know, in subsequent days, established the Free Church um, on, the, on the great principles that they, they followed. And um, it was a costly decision for those men uh, and their families, as, as we'll emphasise in the film in relation to Thomas Burns, who was one of the oldest of the dissenting ministers and who really paid a very, very high price in terms of his material comfort in taking the principled stand that he took. Um, so that's, that's a really important place to go. It's the starting point, if you like. Just around the corner is the Otago, or what was the location of the Otago Immigration Office. So you see that we have here contemporary documents from the Toitu collection where we've honed in on exactly where the places are, and then we've gone looking for them. And we've been able to do that with the help of these maps. Now, the map resource is um, amazing from the Scottish National Library, where they've digitised huge numbers of maps, particularly 19th century maps, and they've also geo-referenced them. Now, what that means is, I'll just flick out of this for a minute to show you how that works. So. Um, when they geo-reference them, they tie them in so that other maps can be used. So here we are. This is the site. Now there you can choose from a whole range of maps which map is your primary map. And I've chosen there one from the Ordnance Survey showing Edinburgh sometime in the 1850s, I think. Oh no, it's not Edinburgh, it's Greenock. So this is a Greenock map. We were looking for the place that Minnie Dean was born in Greenock. Now we can... We can um, we can hone in on that. The spot I've picked there is where she was born there, so there's the address. But better than just honing in on it, from our point of view, when we want to try and find that today, is that you can pick another map, and I've chosen an open street map, and then you can just see what it's like today. <laughs> so it's a magical tool for us to find specific spots. And I spent the three weeks while Will was arranging our logistics because I was a bit late in the day to work out how this worked. <laughs> but when I did, I spent the three weeks setting up a big list, which I've got here, um, with all the spots we were going to geo-referenced. Uh, sorry, take that out of the road. Um, it's this list here. So every one of those is a link, which you can just copy into a Word document, and then it takes you back to where you were. It's brilliant. So we've got you know all hundreds and hundreds of um, hundreds and hundreds of locations there, day by day, every location. And what I would do in the mornings, so that we weren't dependent on having live um, internet access, which we could do on the job, but you never knew when we were up in the Highlands, it could get a bit dodgy. So in the morning, I'd just go through on my iPad and click up every um, georeference map, and then take screenshots of it, so that we had hard copies. So when we got to the places, I just whipped through those. And we'd have the old map and have the new map, and you could go back and forth, and then you'd see what was there. You know, so it's an amazing tool, and that was pivotal to our ability to get down to the right spots. Now, sometimes we might have got it wrong. You know, fair play. We we looked at hundreds. We, we won't be 100% accurate, but we did our best to pick out the spot and to go and frame our story up in relation to that spot. Now, just um, another little tool we had here. I'll just show you. Um, while well, we dipped out of that, here is our list of locations on a day-by-day -day basis. And you can see on the right all those um, numbers. 
Those are the codes for our script. So we've written a whole script, the whole thing's scripted up, did that during the lockdowns. Um, and we have two, two, two sets of stories. So there's two things. We've created a big story, which is a journey to Edinburgh, which is about three hours long. That's the M stories, the main stories. But alongside that, and separate to it, we've also traced the story of 100 individual pioneers or pioneer couples. Those are the S stories. So every one of those scripts has got a coded number, they're in an alphabetical order, and then we broke up every paragraph within them and coded those to a number, and then the locations are coded back to that. So you can see it's quite a logistical exercise. You do hundreds and hundreds of places, 100 people, big stories, and this is how we kept it all together. Will's very good at this sort of thing. So there you see that there's a location, the person that might be related to it, um, and then whether it's an S story, an M story, um, exactly the coded reference. So every day a script would be, we'd printed it out, it would have them in sequence as we were going. So whether it was an M story and an S story. So I might be you know, standing here talking about something from the M story and then stand here and do an S story and maybe be another S story here. So it was, you know, we, I didn't have to keep track of it. It's just on the job, paragraph by paragraph. That's how we worked it. So that's pretty, I think that's a really impressive document and it worked really well. We do that in the New Zealand side as well. You can see down the bottom he's got local um, locations, so going to see Ray Beard's more will be down there when we went out to West Tyree, whatever. So um, it's all there. So that's a, a great um, tool, so I'll just share that with you. Now we go back to the uh, pictures, which is over here. So that's where those maps come from, and that's what a key tool they were. Aren't they wonderful? I love old maps. I just love them. So then trying to find what that looked like, as I say today. So we're pretty confident that that building is the same, might not be, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell, you'd go looking to see information about the buildings and sometimes it was straightforward, sometimes not too sure, but that's the location anyway, that's where it was. And then around the corner, not far away, in South Hanover Street, which we can tell from this document here, which you might be able to read, but it says 27 Hanover Street, um, Edinburgh, this was the Leo Station's office, the Otago office, that's where it was, it was John McGlashan's law office in fact, it's up there. This is a photograph I took 2012 when I first went to Edinburgh. I went looking for this, but as you'll see, we, we filmed there. We'll come back to that. So that's a really important location. They're all within a block of each other, those three. Um, in London now, the headquarters of the New Zealand Company in London was in the Broad Street buildings. It was called New Zealand House, and all of you will immediately think of that very ugly building in central London that is New Zealand House now. It's not that New Zealand House, and we can't find any images of it. We look pretty hard. Can't find the images, and it took a long time to find it on the maps as well. But there it is, there, uh, Broad Street, and uh, near the Liverpool Street Station. That's where it was, the big building, and that's where the New Zealand Company operated out of throughout the period of the Otago um, uh, New Zealand Company settling Otago. So we, we we went to where that was, even though there's nothing to see there of a historic nature. That's where it actually happened. And you know, trying to work out where Captain Cargill was was pretty tricky. Um, but w then we found this. Um, letter addressed to him from the right period in our collection, Walbrook Street. So we went there as well. Again, that's all completely modernised now, but we stood on that spot where he had um, been based in the critical periods when he was holding the torch alight for Otago, and he alone kept it going, you know, through that uh, really dark period of the mid-1840s when it really looked like it wasn't going to happen. Stubborn old Captain Cargill <laughs> kept it going. Without him it wouldn't happen. So, you know, Mount Cargill, he's out, you know, with, you know, worthy of the places to name that, worthy of the monument. Without him, this wouldn't be. So, good on him. So, we went to that place as well. Um, now, this is a really important place too, because as I say, the Otago scheme, although it was proposed in 1843, there were so many times when it crashed and burned, it just wasn't going to happen. So, you get to August 1847, this is four years later, and they had nothing to show for it. You know, they didn't have anyone ready to go. And then all of a sudden, rebranding, relaunch, and this is where it happened at the Trades Hall in Glasgow. And that's the building. Um, beautiful building. We actually um, were hoping we could get inside. I had a contact that was going to get us inside, but it didn't work out in the day. But the outside's really impressive. So this is where the relaunch happened in August 1847, which kicked things off so that only a few months later they actually went. People actually went to Otago and actually started. Really critical place. So it's good to go there. And this is where they left from. This is the Custom House Quay in Greenock. And it looks very much the same today as it would have then. That, that building was there then. 
So here we are looking out over the Clyde, and that's where the Philip Lang departed from. So a very important place. And later in the 1850s, a lot of other ships left from here as well. Most of the New Zealand Company ships, however, left from London, from Gravesend, so we went there as well. Um, only a couple of the Otago Association ones, the Multan and the Philip Lang. But later on, yes, the ships started to go from there, the Paddy Henderson Company starting up, and we went to their um, quay in, at Broomy Law in the middle of the city, and so on and so forth. So going to the accurate spots, the key part of our kaupapa, I suppose you could say, that's the way we rock. We want to find the real spots, talk about the real people, how it actually happened, when it happened, tell the story, get the narrative right, and then interpret things as you like. But you've got to get those details right. That is our foundational approach. And here we are, walking around the streets of Glasgow early in the morning. Because as you can imagine, Glasgow's a pretty busy sort of place. And um, we had to get up pretty early to beat the crowd so we could film in front of those buildings without having too much bother from buses and pedestrians. But I have to say, Unlike in Dunedin, <laughs> where we are always harassed by dopes who toot their horns and that sort of thing and really irritate me as Will could testify, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in London, we didn't get that once. So there's a certain immaturity about people in Dunedin, <laughs> I feel. Anyway, now, in terms of the 100 people stories, we started off on the very first day, sorry, Ray, um, we went to the Isle of Butte, which is just across Wee Ferry Ride from Glasgow, but a world away. You know, it's just a short trip, you're in a different place. And Rothsay, principal settlement there, beautiful little spot. We were looking at the story of the Gillies, John Gillies. And we knew exactly where he'd worked. He'd been the town clerk there, very important guy. He brought his whole family out. They're very important people in, you know, in terms of Otago history, but we were going back to the beginnings. And this older couple, older people, not that often that older people came out here, they'd come out from um, Rothsay, and they'd built here Lilybank. For this, this is Lilybank in Dunedin, but this is Lilybank in Rothsay. And we knew it was there, we didn't know if it would survive, and we didn't know if we'd be able to find it, because on these maps, sometimes when you get you know, out into the nether regions, it's a bit loose. So we were driving around this hillside, looking at all these houses, it could be that one, it could be that one. And then we found one that had the sign on it saying Lee Bank. And this is one of the great features in Scotland, names. It's pretty important with farms. All the farms have names in Scotland. They're all on the gates. So useful, you know. So useful because you know you got to the oh here we are oh definitely it you know it's really reassuring because you know the maps are all well and good but finding the name on the gate is pretty useful so that's Lily Bank in Scotland here's Lily Bank here nice to have those two connections and there's the Gillies in the middle so again that's the sort of thing we're trying to do now just to give you a few locations one of our principal characters Reverend Thomas Burns this is where he was born Mosgiel Farm and that's where Mosgiel of course gets its name from although it lost an S in transition from um, Ayrshire to New Zealand, but Mosgiel Farm. Uh, famous, of course, for its association with Robbie Burns, which is what the monument's all about, because he and his brother Gilbert farmed there in partnership, um, and uh, he wrote some of his most famous poems there, including To a Mouse. So, you know, pretty venerated spot, and everything to do with Robbie Burns is, is plaqued up or monumented up in Scotland, so that's pretty useful. But we weren't looking for Robbie in this occasion, we were looking for Thomas, and that's where he was born. So that was good. But later on, his family moved up market a bit, and they went to Dinning Farm in um, Headington. Where's that? In Dumfries, I think. So this was a really exciting place to go. It took a drive across country and windy old roads, and you just didn't know what you were going to get when you found. Then we found, oh, this is the place. This is where. We, and the people were there were very friendly. This is another feature I'd have to really um, acknowledge how friendly all the locals were, and how helpful they were, and how almost universally they were very glad for us to film at their place, not at the Withers place, that was the one exception. <laughs> um, and this is the school he went to. Schools were a really important part of our story because oftentimes it was the education that Scots received that gave them that key advantage which made them such successful immigrants all around the world, that the educational uh, superiority of the Scots system really gave them an edge and made them such successful colonists all over the place. And that's where Thomas Burns uh, did some of his education. And that's the church he built. It was called Burns's Folly. That's at Moncton. That's the new church. Um, and there you can see 
great to find, a plaque commemorating that connection. You know, that's always very reassuring. But this is the um, place he went to university, the old college in Edinburgh. Um, he did his um, arts degree there. And this is the old church that he came to at Moncton when he was first a minister, a very old church, famous um, for its connection with um, William Wallace and Blind Harry and his poem and so forth and so on. But it was a very small place, that's why he built the new one. Uh, plaque there again, which recognises Burns' connection. One, at least, of his children are buried there. Might be more than one, but there's a little gravestone there, so that's important. And here's the beautiful manse that he left um, in going out in the disruption. He and his family lived there with servants and orchards. It was idyllic. And it's been recently restored, so you know, it had had a rough cast exterior, which kind of hid the beauty of this lovely sandstone place. But that's, that's what he walked out on. And actually, it was his wife um, who walked out. He was away at the disruption. She anticipated what was going to happen, and she was already packing up, ready to go, committed fully to what course he took. And they moved down to the road to little rented premises and you know, did it hard for a while before they came out here to start again. So that's a really important location. Now here's another one, and that's Watson Shannon. Watson Shannon's such an important character in terms of Otago's um, pastoral history because he and his brother Alex, as very young men, just in their early 20s, just out of their teens in fact, came here looking for land for sheep. And they went exploring up into the um, Manahira Kia, did it really hard, really hard, and then took sheep up there and began the runs at Galloway and uh, Motori and began, you know, um, sheep farming in the central. So they really pushed the boundaries that the pioneers had been very focused on the coastal zone. They pushed inland. So critical figures. But they came from a very um, successful farming family back in Scotland. But there were eight, I think there were eight boys. I might get the details wrong. There's a lot of boys and a lot of kids in this family, girls and boys. And, you know, although their family had a number of farms around the, around the area, they couldn't all be fitted onto it. So they had to go out to find a spot for themselves to prosper. And in the end, Watson came here, Alex came here, um, and then another five, I think, came out here, and all did pretty well out here. But where did they come from? Well, we have a great help from the Shannon family. There's particularly a, a biographer working in a descendant, Jane Shannon, in, in Australia. She's a great help to us. So she put us onto this particular farm, Leadloch, and uh, put us in contact with the farmer. Um, but all your plans can go to hell sometimes, you know, because we were driving down the road, plotting it out, and all of a sudden we hit roadworks. <laughs> we couldn't get through. We had to go this big loop, and it threw us out of whack. So we were coming. So we missed the sign as we drove down the road, and Will was wanting to be quick about it. So. We parked up against this boring field, which was somewhere near, and we were going to do it there. But then this farmer came walking along the road. We said, oh, well, ask him. He said, oh, yeah, you're a kilometre up there. you just, you just gone past it. Oh, so we drove up the road, and here it was, Leadlock. <laughs> Brilliant. And here he was, waiting for us. And that's what he said. Oh, we're just supposed to come here two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we got there. It was bloody good. Leadlock. And that's the other thing, pronouncing the names. Always tricky. You know, some of those Scottish names, they might look one way, but they pronounce another way. So we got, I was checked if I could with the locals. So instead of saying Laird, whatever I would have said, Leadlock, that's how you say it. So good to know. Now this is where Alex lies. So Watson came out with his brother, Alex, who was older than him. Alex then went back. He sourced um, top merino stud from um, Europe, sent them out, which really boosted Otago's um, sheep breeding profile of Merino sheep, but he uh, went to university um, and died of typhoid um, just a couple years later. So he, he never made the sense, but that's, whoops, that's his, that's his grave in the local cemetery, so it was really good to go to that, acknowledge that pioneer of Dunedin back home with his people. Um, so this is another example of the, the three locations associated with John, Sir John Roberts, very important figure obviously here um, with the sheep industry and wool and making the link with the mills on the borders. Uh, family connections are really important to the thriving uh, woolen connections in the latter part of the 19th century, which made him a very wealthy man, of course. So there's the old mill, Forest Mill, and you can see it's derelict. So those once thriving border industries are all gone the way of you know, our industry here. You know, we've also got Roslyn Woolen Mills repurposed. Well, this one hasn't been repurposed. It was a bit of a sad sight, to be honest. 
Um, this is where he grew up. There's Sir John Roberts there. This is where he grew up in the Hermitage House. Um, what's the name of that street? I can't remember the name of the town, actually. Where is it, Will? Selkirk. Selkirk. And this is where um, the family lived later, this big mansion, Wellwood Park, which um, Little Born House here was kind of modelled on, you know, which was the Roberts Mansion up on the hill, no longer here with us, but there's Little Born Park. So great to find those places and tell the stories. Now, here's a really important guy in our story that most people don't know about now, you know, James Adam. James Adam was one of the ordinary characters on the Philip Lang, just a working man. But he did so well in Otago that he was sent back to Scotland in 1857 to recruit other people like him. And he did a brilliant job of it. There he is. And there's the appointment. And his, you know, telling people he's going. Now, ignore this. This was circled for another reason. But look up there. Here's a letter he wrote from the Spread Eagle Hotel in Jedburgh in November 1857, reporting back to Cargill on where he'd been and what he'd been up to. He talks about all the places in the area that he'd done talks at. He was there for 18 months, and he did about 130,000 kilometres, he reckoned, well, he said miles, travelling all over Scotland and England, doing these promotional talks for Otago. And he recruited over 2,000 people, and he arranged the ships, and they all came in 1857-58. It's a key point of peopling for Otago. James Adams is the man who recruited those people. So many families owe their origins in Otago to this guy and his very effective promotion of Otago based on what he knew. He did it again in the 1870s for the New Zealand government. Thousands more came. And he wrote a book called 25 Years of Immigrant Life in the South, which sold widely and also meant thousands more came. So thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are New Zealanders owe their being here to James Adam. So it's really important, but you know, sort of forgotten about. So we were going to film the Spread Eagle Hotel, but there you go, scaffolding, <laughs> bugger. So we stayed there actually, that's where we stayed on this particular night. So we did it on the inside. It wasn't quite as effective, I don't think, as filming the outside, but it's the best we could do, so you have to adapt. Um, one of the oldest pubs in, in, in Scotland. Here's another one. This is in Glororum Farm um, on the borders there where John Turnbull Thompson comes from. And, you know, just as we pulled up to, on our very tight time frame, a damn petrol tanker turns up and parks right in front. So we, so we had to wait. But anyway, the, 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 this is the little, little things that go wrong sometimes. Here we are in Edinburgh, the great mother city of Dunedin. Epic place to be. We spent a few days there, obviously, and we had lots of filming to do walking about the place. Up on Arthur's seat, getting a good view of it. Um, tremendous. I'm sure some of you have been there. Pretty craggy at the top there, you have to watch your step. Wish we did. And then we started walking down a nice little graduated path. And all of a sudden, our star, the presenter, flat on his ass. <laughs> Bang, my elbow really hurt. Could have been the end of things. Just a bit bruised. And obviously a bit embarrassed. But anyway, we got past that. So here we are, filming outside Hanover Street, the um, office where so many early settlers, the very earliest ones, would have had to write there or go there to be interviewed to get their passage to Otago. That's the wee portal, that office, that's where you had to go or send your letters to get here in 1848, 1849, 1850. So great to go to the actual places and see they're still there. This is the Free Church Hall in the mound in central Edinburgh and just a little example of Mr. McKee because, you know, getting access to places like this and there were policemen all around the place today because someone was coming. Who was it? Some moderator of the Presbyterian Church. Moderator of the Presbyterian Church. So it was a, you know, we were right on the wrong time for that, but they were very friendly. And um, yeah, good negotiations, shaking the hand, very friendly, very helpful, and on we went. And this is what we were looking for there. This picture here shows that great event in 1848, the, the um, disruption, the, the sign of the deed of demission, established the Free Church. And there's hundreds of people here. It's an epic picture. It's painted by David Hill from photographs, photographs that were taken in 1843. Some of the earliest photographs of the guys who were signed And He spent the next 20 years painting this big painting based on those photographs. So there's 450 ministers or something he paints from that. And where's Thomas Burns? I spent ages once looking for him. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Couldn't find him. 
And then we discovered we had this print in our collection where he's identified by this very helpful little annotation. <laughs> so there's Wally, right there. And there it is, the original. Beautiful big painting. Look at these clowns in the background. This is um, a very friendly custodian at the Free Church Hall who's expecting us. We'd, we'd let them know we were coming. Took us all around the place, really friendly, really into our project. Um, and there is Thomas Burns in the painting. Just on the edge of things, but he's there. So very satisfying to see that. And then um, I think his name was Roland. Or he took us up the top of the tower to get a great view out over Edinburgh, some great scenic shots that we wouldn't have got any other way. He insisted on it, in fact. Climbed up ladders and up through turrets, and out we came. Brilliant. Here's a lady at St John's Church in Perth, uh, where we did some filming for one of our stories. Lovely, lovely lady, very helpful. But a little jib here against the Presbyterians. <laughs> When I was prepping all this, there were so many church locations and they had things inside the churches that related to Otago people. And I just assumed, being a Catholic, that you could just go in and say a prayer in a Presbyterian church would be open. But they weren't. <laughs> they were all shut. This was really unusual because there was a group visiting that it was open early in the morning when we went there. So we did get to go inside St. John's Church, but didn't get to go in too many others. So we had to work around that. And it's just a little facility. You can't make assumptions, you see. I assumed. And I was wrong. But this is the McKee in action. Wandering up paths, knocking on people's doors. And this is his methodology. We'd sit in the car, out of the road, no cameras showing, just so they'd freak, the, you know, freak them out. He'd go in there wearing his shorts and his jandals and you know, looking very, you know, his cap. And out he'd go with his hand out stretched and he'd go, Hi, William Key from New Zealand. And that was the trick, New Zealand. They didn't hear about the William McKee. Who the hell's William McKee? New Zealand. It opened the door every time a coconut. <laughs> and they were so friendly and welcoming and almost always had a New Zealand connection themselves. It's quite recent. So, you know, the welcome was there. There's a great sense of it. Here's another one. Glororum Farm. Yep, you can film. Sure, what do you like? Here we are. Yep, no problem. There you go. <laughs> oh, yep, no worries. Well, actually, in this one, he struck a bit of a hitch. This is in Temple. Now, Temple is a little village which has been besieged in recent years by mad Americans obsessed with the Da Vinci Code and Knights Templar. <laughs> they're not very keen on people coming and filming, and they think they're nuts. So he wouldn't even open the door, this guy. So we're sitting there talking to him. Meanwhile, out the front, we, this fella came out, saw well, Chris and I hanging around. What are, you, what are you up to? And he was super friendly, and he owned the house. This is what we were actually looking for. So it all worked out in the end. But we had to get around that little hitch with the uh, Knights Templars at Temple. Uh, this is a guy really helpful in um, A.T. Thompson's place. Again, this is uh, Abbey St. Bathans in the Borders. And in this case, we're under this ticking time clock because they were having a, a rally on these remote rural roads and they had roadblocks. So they just let us through, but you've got 20 minutes. So we had to get through, we had to find the place, link up with the person, do our filming, and then, uh, or we were going to be cut off. You know, We couldn't afford to be held up, so this was a real time pressure. And he would have taken us into the house and down to the church, but we just didn't have time. But very helpful nonetheless. And you know, I just want to acknowledge that amazing part of um, working with the people everywhere we went, really helpful. And there's Abbey St. Bathans just down the road. Now, schools again, super important. This is at Stirling. This is where Archibald Anderson went to school. Very successful settler. Um, Stirling in South Otago, very much associated with, um, with him, named after his hometown. Um, and there you go, the old grammar school. And you see there it says the better off boys of the town. Well, he was one of those better off boys, and he got a good education there. And he came to New Zealand not as an impoverished you know, person, but as someone with means and ambitions, and um, deployed all those things here, first in Wellington, then down here in Otago, and then down south Otago. But the education's really important. Those Scottish guys who came here, and women, with good educations, played such a critical role in developing our society, and the emphasis on education that we've had here historically in Otago as well. So good to see that. Um, that's where uh, R.A. Lawson went to school, at um, Grange of Lindoras, a ghost town the day we went there. We couldn't find anyone to talk to there, um, but you know it was a beautiful spot nonetheless. And graves. We were often looking for graves, and graves can be hard to find. <laughs> so we had a big list of them, and we'd always get out and hope that they might have a guide to the cemetery there, or we might have a block of block, usually no, no such thing. 
So we just split up and go here and off all over the graveyard. And Will seems to have an unerring skill for finding graves. Because Chris and I would be going up and down, looking, looking, there we go, oh, here it is. How do you do that? So, sometimes super quick too. So that's um, the Douglas grave in um, Delry. Delroy, I'm not sure how to say that. Delroy. Um, now, we couldn't go past our great uh, figure of culture. And you'll recognise the statue because it's very similar to the one in the centre of Dunedin. There are four of them, in fact. Slightly different, all by Sir John Steele. This is the one in Dundee. This one is in um, London, in the Embankment Gardens in central London. The one here in Dunedin, and the other one's in Central Park in New York. Right. Key figure for the Otago Settlers Association is Donald Reed, your second president. Key guy in um, the establishment of this organisation. Well, this is where he came from. His farm he grew up on is just over here, Pitt in Newcastle. Quite hard to find up on the hills, despite our maps. Because for all the maps, it was a little web of tiny little roads that weren't on the map that we had to wend our way around. And we were looking for the farm, which we couldn't get to. But we were also looking, this is the three places. This is where his farm was. This is where he walked down the hill, through this estate, and then up over here to where he went to school. And we went looking for all those places. And... We got to about here, asking the farm, oh, no idea, but uh, right above it was the school. There it is there, <laughs> Daniel Stewart's school. Very satisfying when you find a place like that, which is so important to your story and it's really quite hard to find. Um, now, going back to James Adam, and time's kind of up. Do you want me to keep going or do you want me to cut it all off? Keep going, keep going? all right. Okay, so this is Aberdeen. Now, Aberdeen, like many Scottish places, in the Reformation, they had these great big Catholic churches. We built them. Um, <laughs> but with the Presbyterians, they wanted to have smaller congregations. So oftentimes, they'd divide them up. So you'd have three congregations sharing one big church. So in Aberdeen, they had three congregations at what they called the Triple Kirk for that reason. And James Adam was the presenter of the West Free Church here in the front portion of it. So there it is today. Only a little stump of it remains, and it's the West Church frontage stump. The rest has all been bowled over and big modern buildings put there. But there was that, so that was really cool. And this is Belmont Street. Now, the great thing about James Adam is while for most people, we can only speculate as to why they chose to come specifically to Otago. You know, you can work it out from the general context, which is what we're doing. But in his case, we knew exactly, because he describes in his book how one night... In 1847, he was wandering along Belmont Street when he heard that there was a talk that night in his church about the islands of New Zealand and their cannibal inhabitants. <laughs> and he thought he would go along and have a listen, because he was already thinking about emigrating to Canada. So he went along, and he was really impressed with Thomas Burns. He didn't speak for long, and he didn't make grand claims, but... He was humble enough to accept that he didn't know much about Otago, but he was going. This is what impressed Adam, that this old guy, 50 or something, <laughs> was actually going to go. He was going to put his money where his mouth was and go to Otago. And he thought, yeah, yeah, I could go. So he went out afterwards to talk to him, and Burns was thrilled that this young guy, who was uh, newly married, had a baby, he was a skilled um, carpenter and contractor, boat builder, and he was a devout free church man who was the presenter, the man who led the singing in this congregation. Brilliant. So he says to him, well, you know, if you come, you could be my presenter in Dunedin. And you can have free passages for your family, so long as you stay for five years. So Adam said, righty-ho, that'll do me. Then he went home and told his wife. <laughs> as you'll hear in the film, she wasn't best pleased. She didn't want to go. This is pretty... Typical of um, Scots women in this period as well. A lot of them were quite reluctant immigrants. Drag kicking and screaming, pretty much, as she was. She had to come in the end. Um, but that's an interesting story, you know, to get at that point, that you know sometimes you had to immigrate not because you wanted to, because you were part of a family unit. So anyway, that's, that's the Adam story. So really important to tell those stories in, in, um, in uh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen is a very important source place for lots of people to come to Otago. And James Adam, of course, um, ended up out on the um, Tokamorero Plain there at Bon Accord. He came from the Bon Accord district of uh, Aberdeen, and Bon Accord is the motto of Aberdeen. So his farm being called Bon Accord is quite important. Anyway, 
Then we headed north, way north, up to Shetland. That's our little cabin on the ferry. We're overnight sailing, 12 hours on the, on the ship up to Shetland. And fortunately for us, every single ferry ride we had, flat as a pan. No, we didn't get a wave. It's brilliant. You know, we expected to have quite rough sailings. We didn't get any rough sailings, so it was great. Got to Shetland, and this is what we did in our first day on Shetland. <laughs> we went everywhere. This is the way we rock. Bleak landscape. Bleak, bleak, cold. But down in Lyric, where we were looking to focus for the Sir Robert Stout story, lovely little beach there in the middle of town. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? And this is actually where Stout's family comes from, Stout's Court, which Tom Brookings always found very amusing. The Stout's Court, named after the family because he became the Chief Justice as well as Premier of New Zealand and so on and so forth. This is Lyric at midnight from my hotel window. You can see how light it is? It was just as light at 3 a.m. I got up to take another photo then. So we're way up north, and it was brilliant. Then we headed into the Highlands, and you know, you'd think this was Otago, wouldn't you? But I didn't tell you that was Highlands, but we're on our way up to the Highlands. Uh, this is Halkirk, the Ross Institute at Halkirk. So John Ross, Ross and Glen Denning, a man who didn't forget where he came from, and from his great wealth, created this institute for the people of his hometown. And it's still used today. Uh, so that's quite nice to have that memorial of someone from Otago um, and, and the wealth that they generated being poured back into their home place. Uh, the Immigrants Memorial at um, Helmsdale, uh, brilliant statue, commemorates all those Highlanders who were cleared off their land. So the clearances don't have a direct impact on Otago because there's no sort of clearance and come to Otago, but they do have an indirect impact. Lots of people who were cleared and then went down to the lowlands subsequently come out here, even if it's the next generation or the next generation after that. So this is a shadow, if you like, in the background of the Otago story, if not a direct driver of people to come here. So it was important that we cover this. So we did a few Highland stories, obviously. This is Strathbrora, beautiful place, but looks magnificently empty, doesn't it? Well, once upon a time, there were thousands and thousands of people who lived up there, and they had done for generations after generations, 40 generations of people lived up there, until the 19th century when they were cleared out by the Duke and Duchess of Sutherland, or they weren't the Duke and Duchess in count counties of Sutherland, to improve things and modernise things. And you know, that's true, they did modernise things and they had some innovative schemes. But you know, the human cost of that was pretty high, as modernisation always involves. You, know, you think of anything, you know, roger, roger nomics, you know, there's always it's sort of a similar sort of thing to that, I suppose, you know, and there's cost to people. So we were looking at it. So this is again, these empty strath areas. Uh, where so many people had come from, and, and we're, there are direct Otago connections with this area. And of course, James Hunter's magnificent book on the Sutherland Clearances was our source point there. And the big disappointment for us is that James Hunter, who had been willing to meet us back in 2020, wasn't able to meet us when we got there this time. He's my favourite Scottish historian. Recommend any of his works, brilliant reading. Anyway, um, we, we followed his guidance to go up Strathbrora. Um, and then we went up to the Manny. Now, this is a great story to think about in terms of monuments, statues, you know, bastard statues, you might say. This is the most hated monument in Britain. The statue of the Duke of Sullivan at Goldsby. Look how big it is. See, this us at the bottom of it there. So it's, you know, right up there. Now, the locals, when all this Me Too stuff and pull down statues thing was current a couple of years ago, a lot of people said, oh, pull it down, pull it down, blow it up. The locals said, no way. That statue poses the question, what's he up there for? What's he about? And then you can tell the story. So at the time, obviously venerated by the establishment, but you know, hated by thousands. Um, so you know, that's, that's the point of having statues to people who played a part that we would now see as nefarious in history. It's a reminder of that. It's a reference point. It's a place of interpretation. You knock it over, well, what do you got? You've forgotten all about it. Well, it's worth remembering the bad as well as the good, the baddies as well as the goodies. You know, monuments don't mean you're a goodie, they just mean you're memorable. So we walked up the mountain. <laughs> to the Manny. And yes, I did urinate on it, um, but that was just a little gesture, you know. Um, but anyway, there's his house, Dun Robin. Isn't that a good name? When they're Dun Robin, they came down and <coughs> parked up in the house. So Will and um, Chris didn't want to go inside, but I went back at the end of the day because I really wanted to think about these people because, you know, they were, they were operating by their best lights and in their own terms, they were doing great work. There they are, the Duchess and the Duke. These are the ones that are responsible for the clearances. 
highly regarded in the society of their day, venerated. Here's another Highland story. This is the church at, let me just forget the name sometimes there. We're getting through it, folks. Not too far to go. Um, Croik. This is the Croik Church Church in Rosha. Now, this is famous for an incident during a later clearance when the people of Glen Kelvey, who had been cleared off their lands, took shelter in the churchyard at night. They slept among the graves in desperation. And while they were there, they scratched messages, pathetic messages, you'd say, into the windows of the church. Here you go, you can see them there, message from 1843. So that's a sad, sad thing. And the reason it became famous was because the news, a Times reporter from London was there and witnessed it and publicised it and brought a lot of um, attention on the Highland clearances at the time, the late clearances. So there was some social change generated as a result of it. But from our point of view, what's important about this isn't that so much as this. That guy there, John McKenzie, he was a small boy in the neighbouring valley. And at dawn, his father took him by horseback over to see these people in the churchyard. And that seared itself into his memory. I think he was nine. He never forgot the misery of those people camping among the graves in the Croyd churchyard. And when he came to New Zealand and became a you know, moderately successful farmer up in um, you know, Palmerston, that area, he quickly got into politics. He had to learn to speak English. He was a Highland you know, Gaelic speaker. But then he became a um, pretty successful politician and became the Minister of Lands in the Liberal government who was responsible for breaking up the great estates, driven by this memory of the people being cleared off the land and determined that New Zealand should become a country for small farmers and not for big oligarchs. Um, so he achieved that. Although, to be fair, his biographer Tom Brooking points out that at the cost of, um, not in Otago, but in the North Island, um, lots of Maori land. He didn't seem to see Maori as worthwhile participants in this venture. So under his aegis, a lot of Maori land was taken and then broken up to be farms for Pākehā colonists, I suppose. So, you know, goody, baddie, bit of both. There's a memorial to him as well. And should we pull it down because of that? No, we shouldn't. We should use it as a point of reference for the whole story, good and bad. Anyway, that's his home farm, Baldoon Farm. And we went there and we were welcomed in by these fellas, who were well aware of his story, um, got connections to the farms, and just great to see these, there's Will in the middle, three farmers together. What a sight, eh? Warms the cockles of your heart. Now, another ruin from the Glengarry's, and again, this is a, a Highland clearance story. The uh, Glengarry McDonald's were premier among the clearers, but also their chieftain was premier among the posy ponces who like to dress up in Highland garb and have a retinue and play the part of the big chieftain all the time, pushing his people off the land to get sheep in there to get more money to fund this extravagant lifestyle he was living. Well, that's the ruins of the traditional, the ancient seat of the Glengarry McDonald's. And in that area, there are no descendants of the McDonald's anymore. No one lives there who's descended from these ancient people. Mostly they live in Canada, in Glengarry County in Ontario, where they were cleared and left to. But here in Dunedin we have a connection because this was the 15th chief who did all that clearing. The 17th chief, his grandson, came out to New Zealand and became a sheep farmer in North Canterbury. But in 1862 he was in Dunedin and he died from some illness in a Dunedin hotel on his own. He's buried in the Southern Cemetery. So this is the ancestral memorial to the Glengarry chieftains, which was quite hard to find, I would say, even with our maps. And there it is there. That's where the ancient burial place of the Glengarry chieftains is. And that is the old monument in the Neen Southern Cemetery with the 17th chief, who should have been in there if he had stayed at home, but he's actually in the Southern Cemetery. Now that isn't there anymore. We've got shards of it on display in our new Edinburgh Gallery, and there's a new, smaller, humbler monument to the chieftain up there that was put up in the 1990s by the clan. But there you go, that's an important spot. Now, Oh, it's going on, isn't it? Sorry. I hope it's interesting enough. If you have to go, just walk out. I'll be going in a minute. Um, this is the hardest place we had to find. This is the burial ground at Ben Curlin. It's associated with the McColls, James K. Baxter's ancestors, who were pioneer settlers on Saddle Hill. 
um, and he attributed their island heritage as a very important part of his poetic vision. So we wanted to go there because there were McColl graves in that cemetery connected with his grandfather, great grandfather, who came out here as an elderly man. We wanted to find that spot. So here's our map. Here's the modern map. It's not very precise. <laughs> Somewhere up on that hill amongst the trees, right? Here's our reference photograph. That's what we expected to be looking for, the fence and the headstones. Well, the best we could do was we parked up the truck, we climbed the fence, we started walking up this muddy, thickly forested hill looking for this. An hour and a half later, we were scattered all over the mountainside and we were about to give up when Chris Quack, he's gone now, found it. But look what he had to find in it. That's what he found. <laughs> My God, that was a success. You know, we were so jubilant when we found that because we thought we were going to be foiled. You know, we don't often get foiled, but we thought we were going to get foiled this time. So when we found out, we were just jubilant. And we filmed our piece, and that's the view out over the loch. You can see how overgrown it all was. <laughs> but we got our man. Now, some of the hazards. This will fill me with the drone. And up in the highlands, midges, quite vicious. So you take precautions, you know, say to yourself. This particular occasion, one night he went out, and he was trying to plug a cable into this camera, and he didn't realise that Chris had swapped something over so that one didn't fit, and he wouldn't give up on it. So he exposed his head. Too long. Well, the next morning, my God. We travelled with a monster for the next few days. <laughs> it was hard to look at him. But he didn't complain. In fact, we had to force him to go to the chemist to get some medication because, you know, we were responsible to his mother. <laughs> she wouldn't have liked it. So, um, yeah. All right, just to finish up, a little example of one of our individual stories. This is the Dallas family from South Otago. And this is a typical story of how people ended up coming to Otago in this 1850s period. So William Dallas was born at Fort Dune there in uh, this area here, in the countryside, beautiful countryside. But like so many people in that period, there was less and less work for people as agricultural labourers in the countryside. So so many of them had to go and find new work elsewhere. Scottish society was the most scientific progressive in the world, apart from England. They were the leaders and innovative as hell and going all guns and making it more efficient and the rest of it. But people were being forced off the land. There was less opportunity for them. So they had to find other work. And there was work for them in Scotland. So that family, from Ockenblay way up there, came down to Dundee and got work in the mills there. See, they lived here. Worked in the Craigie Mill, they lived just there. These big mills, you know, most, the biggest mills in the world at the time for, for jute and for other things. But, you know, hum, hives of industry. But you can imagine what it was like, you know. Noisy, smelly, crowded, this is what they lived in, you know. Prosperous, jobs, but not very pleasant. There's the Craigie Works at the time. Size of Dens Works, huge places in Dundee, made the place, you know, really wealthy sort of place. But that cost humans, it wouldn't be nice to work there. And this is where they worked and lived, and there it is today. Now turned into hotel. Huge places. There's the church where they got married, him and the wife there, that I expected to go and find this stained glass window. Couldn't get in. <laughs> Did without. Here's where they came to an Otago and got land, got back to the land. This was the dream, you see. Because in Scotland, even if you had land, you had it as a tenant. And all the work you put into it, you could lose after the end of your tenancy and someone else would get the benefit. The land only got the benefit of it. In New Zealand... This is what Sir Tom Devine talks about as being so seductive about New Zealand and Canada and Australia. You get the land freehold. And all the work you put into it, you could pass on to your children who could look after it and pass it on to their children. You see? Huge magnet. And this is the land that they got. These people have been, you know, had to leave the land in Scotland, had to work in stinky old Dundee in New Zealand, he, I think his father as well, got land, got back to the land, developed it. Very happy life here, very successful. All right, that's the end of my talk, not the end of our session, because 
next week is the 175th anniversary of the arrival of the pioneers. And you know what the pioneers used to do to commemorate that? They used to sing the old 100th Psalm. James Adam, the presenter, just a week before he died, was there for the 50th anniversary, I think it was, might have been the 60th. He led them in the singing of it here. So today, to finish, we're going to sing the old 100th Psalm in honour of the pioneer settlers. And I'll be your presenter as best I can. Turn that off. So, please stand. I'm sure you know it. If you don't, you can hum. You ready? All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice, serve Him with joy, His praises tell. Come now before Him and rejoice. No Thank you very much.